Hello, everybody. My name is Linda Moyo. I am the leader of the Diversity Council on our Bethel College campus. I have Chris Singleton with me here. He is a former professional baseball player, as well as an inspirational speaker who has traveled the country, inspiring thousands and thousands of people. His story has also been heard and has touched people's hearts all over the media. His mother, Sharonda Coleman Singleton, was murdered along with eight other victims at a church in Charleston, South Carolina, by a white male who wanted to start a race-related war in the US back in 2015. Chris has not only inspired his city, but inspired the nation by spreading the message, love is stronger than hate and love your neighbor after forgiving the man who murdered his mother. Chris, how are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, I'm excited to ask you a couple of questions with me. Um, so how old were you when this event took place? Yeah, so I was 18 years on, years uh, young, I should say. Uh, my mom was taken away from me, so super young. Uh, my freshman year of college is when everything happened. And what was your immediate response when you found out? Where were you? What was the first thought that you had when this all took place? Yeah, I think for a lot of people, um, when you think about trauma, you think about tragedy, initially, you don't know what you would do or what you would say, but uh, immediately my family, my brother and sister who were both younger than me came to mind. Um, mm -hmm. And so you know, immediately after I heard the news that my mom was gone, I said to myself, well, well who's gonna take care of my brother and sister? I have to be able to provide and protect for them. Um, so that's immediately what came to my, mom, my mind afterward. Yeah, for sure. And for an 18 year old, that's something that is unimaginable for you to feel like you now have to be responsible and the man of the household and take care of everything. Um, so you have forgiven this man who murdered not only your mother, but eight other victims. Um, and I have heard the saying, you can forgive, but you can never forget. How do those two things live with one another? How has this played out in your own life? Yeah, I think uh, that's a great point that you made. And I say that quite often, right? You can you can forgive somebody for something that truly hurts you deep down inside, but it's impossible to forget it. Not if it's something that truly struck deep, right? I don't think anybody can just forget the fact that they have a, you know, a traumatic experience that happened to them or, or uh, that was caused by someone else, the harm that was caused, right? So hmm. I think you can forgive without forgetting because uh, in my mom's, you know, in my example, right? My mom's memory, is the reason why I speak about the things that I speak about. The reason why I'm on this mission of unity is because I've forgiven my mother's killer, yes, but I've never forgotten that she, the reason why she was killed, mm -hmm. right? And I want people to understand that it's two different things, um, but forgiveness has allowed me to move forward. And to be honest, if I hadn't forgiven my mother's killer, I, I guarantee you, I wouldn't be able to talk about the things that I speak about when I share. Yeah, definitely. So others, like me and many other people do not have as big of a traumatic event that calls them to forgive in the capacity that you have had to do. So how can we practice forgiveness on a smaller scale? Like what are some daily disciplines to practice that to help um, us to forgive as well? That's a great question. I think number one, um, we, when we think about forgiveness, we have to change our narrative with it, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, initially when people think about forgiveness, they think about weakness, they think about submissiveness, uh, they think about a person who doesn't have any strength. And if we could flip the switch in our brains to think about forgiveness as being powerful, right? Being extremely yeah. tough to do, but worth it. I think that's something that everybody can do. Um, and the second thing that we need to, to realize is why am I forgiving this person? You know, we can say we want to forgive somebody all day uh, and all night, but if we don't want, if we don't know why we want to forgive them, how is it going to help us accomplish our dreams, goals, and aspirations in life? Right? If we don't have things, then it's going to be very tough for us to truly forgive somebody—not just saying it, but in our hearts. 
So something that I personally struggle with is I can forgive other people, but I have a hard time forgiving myself. Do you, have you ever experienced something like that? And how would one overcome forgiving themselves? That is, that is a fantastic point. So I think the hardest thing to do personally is to forgive yourself, right? I mm. think uh, we hear this all the time. They say, how could I do X, Y, and Z? Or what was I thinking, right? We hear those things all the time. But I think as people, as human beings, we all grow each and every single day. The things that we know now, we didn't know a year from a year ago or, or four years ago. And so if we cut ourselves a little bit of slack saying, you know what? I've, I've grown, I've, I've evolved as a person, as a human being, as, as, a, as a believer of, of my morals, whatever it may be, uh, that's when we can finally say, okay, you know what? I'm a different person today than I was five years ago. I should forgive myself for just being ignorant to the things that I thought, the things that I believed, the things that I did uh, and move forward in my life. Yeah, that's amazing. So I'm going to give you a fun fact about Bethel College. A little okay. over 60 years ago, Martin Luther King spoke on our campus. So what do you think he would say um, about what happened to your mother along with the other individuals at that church? What would he say about that event today in 2021? Yeah, that's a that's that's some great history for one. It, it'll be an honor to be able to visit mm -hmm. the same place that he visited. So um, he's one of my heroes. But you know, if I think he, if he was here in the flesh uh, when my mom was taken away, I think Dr. King number one would be disappointed. But I don't think he would be uh, surprised by something like that happening, right? Here's a man that was thrown into jail numerous times uh, just for trying to get people that look like myself to have civil rights. And mm -hmm. I think that he wouldn't be surprised, but he wouldn't. Uh, give up either, right? When something like that happens, I think we have to continue to push forward. And I think he would be leading the charge, pushing people to say, you know what, doesn't matter what our, our skin color is. It's all about our character. Just like that quote, when he says, you don't judge somebody by the color of their skin, rather by the content of their character. I think he would definitely be driving that home had he been there at the time of my mom's passing. Yeah, one of my favorite quotes is, I come as one, but I stand as 10,000. I think I heard that from Maya Angelou. But as you are going out and you're inspiring this nation by you know, your personal experiences, do you have people that you look up to like that? Like when I go up on stage and I have to talk, I always get nervous, but I'm like, you know what? I come as one, but Oprah Winfrey is standing behind me. Maya Angelou is standing behind me. Dr. Martin Luther King is standing behind me. The rest of my ancestors are like right here next to me, cheering mm. me on. Mm. So do you have people in your mind that you always keep uh, with you along with your mother, I'm sure, to help you and support you as you do the work that you do. Wow, that is, first of all, that is deep and powerful. You need to share the stage with me, by the way, you're, you're speaking right now. <laughs> I love it. So just in thinking about all the people that have come before me to get me to where I am today, when I think about my great, great grandfather uh, that may not have had the opportunities that I have today. So I, I consider myself uh, lazy if I don't go after these things, right? Because he didn't have these opportunities. I think about my great grandfather, who I called Granda, who was there every single day of my life, um, cheering me on in the stands. I think about my mom, I think about my father who were who both passed away before they were 50 years old. And so part of me is living out their legacy as well because their life was cut short. So when I think about uh, if I were to ever get nervous, right? I stopped getting nervous a little while ago when it comes to speaking. But if I did, I would think about them. I think about my son, I think about my family. And I think about all the lives that I have the opportunity to share uh, and hopefully change some hearts with, and that would for sure keep me going. Yeah. So a little background history on me. I'm originally uh, from Zimbabwe. I was born there and I moved to the States um, around nine. And now I recently turned 20. And I always struggle with finding my purpose and my passion and living every day as if I have the best opportunities because my own family back home, my friends, everybody, I know that they will never get half of the experiences and opportunities that are given to me. So how do I 
go on about that in a humble way and also still, you know, commit to my mission and not just settle for less than my best? And how can other people, um, especially Bethel College students, uh, most of them might be uh, their first, you know, uh, what do you call it? First generation graduates. So how can they come with all that history and not, you know, feel like they have to overwork too much just to prove their worth, but also stay humble in that process? Yeah. So there's a, there's a quote that says, um, you know, always grateful, but never settle. And mm. what that means for me is that I'm grateful that I, I am uh, privileged enough. We always hear the, the word privileged and we think it's a bad word. But I, I think with me and my family, right, I had two parents that went to college, right, that graduated from college. So I consider myself privileged in that sense, right? I think, you know, we're living in the United States. I think we're privileged in that sense. And I think you could, you would agree with that as well. And so I always say I'm grateful for where I am, but I'm never going to settle, right? I don't want to settle to be where I'm at right now. One of my buddies, Jeremy Anderson, always says that, you know, always grateful, but never settle. And that's what I would encourage people to do. Right. You, you know where you're at right now. Be grateful for the people that have allowed you to get to where you are right now. But it shouldn't be done. Right. We're, we're young. We, we have so much time ahead of us. You know, hopefully. Right. We don't know when our last day on this earth is. So every single day we need to be making sure that we try to make an impact and be the best person that we can be and win that day. Wow. That's powerful. Um. How can student organizations such as Diversity Council who strive to bring and celebrate unity within our cultures communicate to other students and our community about race-related issues while holding each other accountable? Yeah, I think number one, uh, we have to realize that not everybody wants to be the person that's going to be sharing the things that I share about. Right? Mm. When we talk about race, when we talk about uh, certain things like that, it's a cringy topic for some people, right? Because they've never spoken about it before. And I think that once you realize, okay, this isn't everybody's cup of tea, we need to break it down in a way that everybody can relate to. I love sharing stories. I love sharing, hearing different perspectives because that initially can lower that barrier of somebody's opinion that they've been taught for 20 years or for yeah. 40 years. When you share those stories first, then you can get the insight on what that person believes and why they believe it. And that's when you can start to have the dialogue. I see a lot of problems come into place when you know, a person such as myself, I consider myself an activist, even though I'm not marching at every single uh, march or, or, or screaming this or shouting that, I consider myself an activist for unity, right? Yeah. And so with me, I know that, but sometimes before I approach somebody that may have a different perspective or may simply be ignorant to certain things, I have to you know, be humble myself first so mm -hmm. that I don't immediately turn their you know immediately turn their ears off and walk away from it. So yeah. I would I would encourage people to say first and foremost listen to their story before you educate them. Mm -hmm. um, another thing I would advise people to do is if you want to be anti-racist, if you want to learn more about the things you may may or may not have been taught, uh, do some research beforehand. Right? I think it's oh. great for us to be able to teach certain things, but if if you're if you uh, want to learn about them, do some research on your, your own. Google is a, is a huge thing you can use, Bing, whatever you want to use. Do research before you ask those questions. Then I realize, okay, you are serious about it and you do want to learn. Um, Chris, you, with what you have dedicated your life to on spreading such a powerful message of love is stronger than hate, love your neighbor. And I always see you posting hashtag can't let moms down. Do you feel like change is taking place in this country concerning race and unity? I'll tell you, I'll tell you why I do believe that change is starting to come about. Um, I think for the first time in, in a long time, people are starting to put themselves in the shoes of someone else. Mm. And so we talk about empathy being huge. We talk about compassion being being huge right now. I think the ultimate sign of someone changing their heart or changing their perspective is when they say, you know, what if I was in this person's shoes, right? What would I think? What would I believe? And I think when we, we're starting to see that now more than ever before, um, and I think that is why we're heading in the right direction. Now, will it go slowly for some people? For sure. Will it not happen for some people? For sure. But I think that it is happening for, for people. And that, for me, gives me a ton of hope 
uh, moving forward and what I do. How can we um, continue to have that hope, that desire to hold on to the um, little that we can so that we can strive to continue to create better changes? Because in the last 60 years, yes, change has happened. Some people consider it slow. Some people are like, whoa, we have moved way too fast. So how can we continue to walk on this marathon instead of looking at it as a quick race that we're gonna finish anytime soon? Yeah, I think there's a quote that says, um, if you wanna go fast, go alone. If you wanna go far, you go together. Yes. Um, and so right now I think, uh, you know, there's been a lot of conversations people are having, a lot of education that's happening. Um, I think we're we're just equipping ourselves to go together, right? Locking arms with people of all different races, religions, skin colors, beliefs, to all just you know move towards what unity looks like. And for me, that that vision is when I see somebody for who they are and their differences, and I don't automatically assume certain things about them because I realize I didn't choose those things about myself either. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, also, Chris, you have dedicated your life um, on inspiring others from your personal experiences. And one of the things that I deeply believe in is the power of words. That's why we've been, you know, mentioning all these different quotes and the power of storytelling and the healing capabilities that those things have. How has that experience of healing manifested in your life when you are constantly opening up publicly about your personal experiences and trauma? I'm gonna be honest, for me, um, sharing the things that I share about, uh, it's therapeutic for me, right? Mm. I think a lot, of pe a lot of times people go through things and they, they bottle them up. They never express how they truly feel. And with me, I'm an open book, right? I share too much sometimes probably, but I, I share everything because it's therapeutic for me. And I read, there was a good book that says, you know, there's life and death and the power of the tongue. And I think that that is very, very true. Yeah. Um, so I'm just trying to continue to speak life whenever I can. And have you ever had to go to therapy for what happened to your mom or has the stage and talking with all these various people been that, therapy session for you? You know, initially I didn't go to therapy for about two years after my mom was killed mm -hmm. and uh, playing baseball um, for the Cubs organization. We had ther therapists that were there and they were free. And I oh. said, you know what, let me start going. Um, and I started to go and it was life changing for me because for the first time I realized, you know, being strong doesn't mean bottling everything up. Being strong means, you know, I'm sharing these things as a man you know, that, that has heartbreak, that has pain that I felt, and I'm still a man after I let out those tears, right? That that makes me real, it doesn't make me weak. Um, and so that was huge for me. And then from that, I've continued to just, just share, uh, you know, and speak to, you know, colleges, corporations, high schools, middle, all the above, mm -hmm. and it continues to be therapeutic for me. As a college student, and as a psychology major, there is a lot of stigma when it comes to therapy and self-help and working on yourself to better, whether those are your traumatic experiences, whether you're just trying to do what you wanna do to you know, improve. So what words of wisdom do you have for people my age in being comfortable and being open to trying therapy, especially people of color? Yeah, I think uh, for me, uh, it was really just realizing, um, you know, I'm one of one, like there will only be one Chris Singleton that looks like me that has the same DNA as me. Mm. Uh, so why not try to be the best me? If that means trying therapy, let, let me try it, at least to see what it what it's like. I said, always said at the very least, therapy sessions for me where I could talk bad about everybody and uh, get it off my chest, you know what I'm saying? And, mm. and I thought that for me was, was something that I could smile about. Um, but it was just really digging deep and saying, if I want to be the best Chris Singleton that I can be, you know, how do I address the things that I've gone through in my past so that I don't make, so that I make sure that I can be the best father, the best husband, the best boyfriend, whatever it may be, uh, that I can in the future. Now, so that was when initially I made that decision to go ahead and start, you know, going to my therapy sessions. Mm -hmm. 
at Bethel, we have a lot of student athletes. I am not one of them. I don't know anything about any sport. <laughs> what um, advice do you have for all those students, whether they want to go pro after college, whether they're gonna have to stop playing their sport at all and totally get into a different field of work? What words of wisdom do you have for them? Yeah, I'm a I'm a huge sports fan. I'm a huge uh, sports junkie. So I guess we're we're opposites on that end, right? I I love baseball. I played baseball. I was able to play in the minor leagues. Got drafted by the Cubs. I'm a huge basketball fan. I love LeBron James. He's like he's up there for me as far as like influential people to look up to. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think for most athletes, if any advice I could give is is one day you will stop playing like everybody else says, but really when you when you stop playing you need to know who you are as a person not just you know what you did as an athlete i think a lot of times people get caught up in into what they do as an athlete and not who are they who they are as a person and so when they put the bat down or they put the ball down they have no clue who they are uh, as a person and that can be a very scary place for a lot of people so i just advise people to look in the mirror yes you're you're an all-star football player you're a great basketball player hockey whatever it may be but who are you as a person you know, what are your core values that you stand by? And, and once you figure those things out, I think the transition one day, whether it be five years after playing, whether it be, you know, 20 years after a great career, you will know who you are as a person. Yeah. So one of my favorite books that I've been constantly reading is called Chop Wood and Carry uh, Water, the process of I think it's falling in love with the process. I don't remember the rest of the title, but they talked about this same idea that when you have something, it can immediately leave you tomorrow. You never know. And who you're left with is yourself. And as good as that sounds, how do you actually do that? What is what are two practical steps that we can start doing by ourselves to learn and to know ourselves better? Yeah, I think when we talk about uh, you know practical things we can do, number one, I'd say when you look in the mirror, I, I think daily affirmations are powerful, right? What, what are the things that you're saying, mm. right? Or are you saying things that uh, have to do with a person that loves animals, right? I, I love this, right? I wanna serve that. And once you figure those things out, there are so many uh, grassroots nonprofits that you can uh, sh that you can volunteer at, and doing that, I guarantee you, will make you feel twenty times better than you did before you walked in there. Um, doing things like that, I think, are two practical steps. Number one, uh, when you say your daily affirmations, figure out what are the things that make you smile in the morning, right? Number two, go volunteer for organizations that uh, you know back those causes that you said when you looked in the mirror and said them. I lately have been working on positive affirmations. And another thing that I've been doing along with the positive affirmations is looking at myself in the mirror and forgiving myself for anything that I might have, or I think that I might have done wrong or actually done wrong. Um, so what are some of the rituals that you do every day that help you to be a better person? Uh, number one, I spend time with my family. Uh, it's, it's been really good. I know it's, you know, with the pandemic, it's been, you know, hard. People can't see the ones that they love, but the ones that are, you know, close to you, like my wife, like my son, my brother that live in the house with me. Uh, every day I was able to take my son to daycare. I was able to wake him up in the morning, put him down for bed. So family is number one. That's huge for me. Number two, uh, I started doing this when I played in professional baseball. It was mindful meditation, right? Counting my breaths, focusing on nothing else but my breaths and realizing what I do and don't beat myself up for it when I think about something else and getting back to that three, four or five count with my breaths. Um, so that that's something else that I do. Uh, and every single day, I started doing this about a year ago. Um, I, I try to you know read something. I'm a huge audio book guy. So whether it's on the, the car ride to work, whether it's in, in, in the morning when you wake up, when you brush your teeth, just reading something that's gonna help you improve in your life uh, so those are some of the things that I do every single day to become a better me. What are the two books that you have recently just finished reading or you're currently reading? Uh, one's called Atomic Habits by a guy named James Clear. It's a phenomenal book. I'm reading that right now. I uh, finished a book called Extreme Ownership. Uh, that was a great book as well. 
Um, and I, I just got Barack Obama's uh, audio book. So I'm looking forward to diving into that uh, really, really soon. That's great. Um, what out of those two books, the first two books that you mentioned, would you recommend for college students to read in for them to better their lives and school work? Yeah, I'd say Atomic Habits would be a huge one, right? I think when it comes to college, it's easy to procrastinate, right? It's easy to say, I'll, I'll get it done at 11.50 because it's due at, you know, 11.59. I think a lot of times, uh, especially me, when I was in college as an athlete, I would put things off till after practice or after I get back from my road trip. Um, but Atomic Habits basically teaches you the, the science behind, uh, you know, making sure you never procrastinate, the science behind uh, being able to work out every single day or eat healthy, whatever it may be, there's a science behind it. And this the book Atomic Habits just basically breaks it down and shows you how you can build great habits and get rid of those bad habits that you have. So Chris, you have a little boy and recently you wrote a children's book called Different. Tell me more about that. Yeah, so uh, my, my big gift to my mom uh, this this past year, 2020, was a children's book, right? It was a, a book I wanted to write about unity, right? How do I get this message of unity across to young people? Mm -hmm. And uh, children's book was a way. So I self-published this children's book uh, not knowing if it would do well or if it would, you know, flop, it actually did extremely well. Um, and it's called "Different: A Story About Loving Your Neighbor." Uh, and, and the thing that I did was actually read it to my son the day it released, June wow. 17, 2015, five years after, uh, you know, the exact day my mom was killed. So it was a very special moment for me. And uh, the book is is done extremely well. And I'm just grateful that people have have ordered it and have, you know, got it for as gifts. Um, it's been it's been a true uh, honor and, and a pleasure to see it rise. Yeah, I definitely think there is power, especially in children's book that we most often override because we're like, oh, we're adults, we don't read that. But where can people find and buy your book? Because I feel like this, the book different is, has such a powerful message that everyone needs to hear. Yeah, people can go to chrissingleton.com uh, to, to figure out all the info on my book. Um, they can also search it on Amazon. Everybody loves Amazon. So you can just type in Chris Singleton uh, book or Chris Singleton different, and they'll be able to see it there. Thank you for that. So tons of people have asked and talked to you about love and forgiveness in every way possible. However, what is something that you wish you would be asked or rarely get asked? Uh, I think one one thing I, I wish I was asked more about is um, my brother and sister, right? Because my, my mom was a, a mother of three mm. and uh, my brother who is in, co he's about to be in college. He actually just signed his national letter of intent oh, to go cool. play. Yeah, he got a he got a scholarship offer to go play at a school called Lander University. He's playing baseball there. Uh, he lives with me and my wife now. He's seventeen, uh, extremely mature. Got a sister who's uh, twenty, about to be twenty one. She's a junior in college, uh, mm -hmm. like you are, um, and so she does. She's extremely. She does extremely well too. And 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 they are stronger than I am, right? People look at me as far as strength, but my brother was twelve. My sister was fifteen when our mom was murdered, and. Uh, I think without them being here, I don't think I'd be this strong. So I definitely want people to ask me a little bit more about how awesome they are. Well, thank you for sharing that. And hopefully people will, you know, definitely start to ask you more about your siblings. Um, well, Chris, I would like to acknowledge you for your courage, your heart, and your hope. Um, with that, I want to acknowledge how you have made it a mission to spread such a beautiful message all over the world that unites us. I feel like we need that more than ever as human beings. So I would like to say thank you for that. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you.